This is a production of Cornell University. Well, I'm sure this seminar is going to be a bit of a departure from what you're used to. It's not going to be very heavy on research and uh, data, but um, it's more sort of letting you know about who I am, and some of the things I've been doing. I don't know if Justine is here or not. There she is. I wanted to thank Justine because she very nicely pointed out that this was the first seminar that has the word disappointments and lies in the title. <laughs> Of course, well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but as Neil said, I am from New Jersey. And I think the best thing you can say about New Jersey is that it's a wonderful place to be from. Um, but. Uh, you know, it's, sir, I, didn't, I didn't come from a farm background at all. I, I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey, and uh, I still have family there, uh, which I have to go back and visit and fight the traffic on. So um, you know, be, before I get started about sort of some of the things I do, I, I just wanted to say thanks to a few people. And some of you here will recognize the, the gentleman in the upper uh, left-hand part of the screen. There's Bob Becker, and Bob Becker was uh, on the faculty at Geneva. For a number of years, that's who I replaced. Um, he was just a wonderful person, 100% extension. Um, unfortunately, I only got to learn from him for a couple of years because, because he passed away soon after I arrived, a couple of years later. Uh, but Bob certainly was a, a wonderful mentor for me. Um, you know, also at the time when I was hired, U Price was my chair, and, and again, I couldn't have a better uh, chairperson uh, to, to learn from uh, than U Price. And, you know, one of the reasons I think I've had some success in my career is because when I came here, I inherited a wonderful uh, research support specialist technician in Jim Ballerstein. And it's Jim um, has been at Cornell for nearly 30 years, has been running the, a lot of the, the vegetable trials, the processing vegetable trials for a number of years. And, you know, his leadership really allows me to get more into the teaching, to get more into the extension um, that I wouldn't be able to do if I had to stay back in Geneva. So again, um, you know, I just want to give those acknowledgments up front. So for those of you that are not familiar with the vegetable industry uh, in New York State, uh, we are surprisingly large vegetable producers, usually about fifth in the nation in terms of fresh market. And these are the major crops. There's about eight to 10 what I'll call major crops worth anywhere from maybe 30 to $100 million on a given year. Um, we're divided, most of it, about 90% of the value of the industry is based in the fresh market side, but we also still grow quite a few processing crops. And you can see when I'm talking processing vegetables, we're talking <laughs> sweet corn and snap beans, peas, kraut cabbage, uh, carrots, and beets. Uh, some of those, you know, some of the acreage have gone down on those. I know some people will say that every time an old person dies in Florida, they lose one more person that was eating kraut cabbage. But, um, <laughs> Hopefully, we've got some new things and new products that are coming out in Kraut that are somewhat exciting. And then here's where we rank as a state. Uh, as I said, fresh market-wise, you know, for a lot of people, when they think of New York, they don't think of agriculture. But certainly, we are number five in terms of fresh market acres, and, uh, and our value is right up there in processing. We're, we're ranked lower, but still um, doing pretty good. I don't have newer numbers from the 2012 Ag Census, apparently because of the shutdown in the federal government last fall. We're still waiting to get the 2012 results. Um, but what I do have from 2002 to 2007 is that we've seen an increase in the number of farms in New York that are actually growing vegetables. Uh, some of those are existing farms where they've added vegetables, they might have been growing some other things. Um, and we also have a lot of small farmers just getting started with new folks that are coming out and. Uh, trying to get going in that business. Don. Steve, what's the minimum acreage for an entity to be considered a farm? Yeah, the question was what the minimum entity is to be considered a farm. I believe it has to do with how much they earn from it. And that I don't know offhand, OK? And our farms, you know, they, they run from a couple of acres of very diversified crops to, to several thousand acres of processing vegetables. So you know, we certainly run a wide range of, of different uh, groups here. Now, 
This is just a trend that we've seen in vegetable acres since 1990, and you can see it's been pretty steady. The green line is for processing crops, and the red line is for fresh market crops. Um, you know, what I'd like you to look at first is what happened here, and you can see there was a huge spike in uh, production uh, processing acres at that, at that time. Now, a lot of people would say that was because Seneca Foods, one of our processors, uh, worked out an arrangement with Green Giant to grow a lot of what they were packing for Green Giant right here in New York State. I prefer to think that there was another reason, and that was when I was hired. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I suppose maybe the, the deal with Seneca Foods might have something to do with that as well. And although I could embarrass some other entomologists, pathologists, and horticulturalists about when they were hired and what might be happening with the trends here, I won't, I won't do that, but they do know who they are out there. I know as I, I was sitting down and thinking about all the, the issues that uh, vegetable growers face, and these are issues I think that it's the fruit growers, uh, field crop growers, the ornamental growers, they all face these sort of same type of things. Uh, probably if you ask them the number one problem they have, the concern they have is labor. Where is the labor going to come from? All of these crops, with the exception of processing vegetables, require a lot of hand labor. So where is that coming from? The cost of doing business in New York, the competition, how are they going to market? You know, insects and diseases, and we still have the same ones that have been bothering us for generations, and we have new ones constantly coming in. Uh, weed control, which I like to separate out from the insects and diseases because very often, especially for beginning farmers, weeds is what kills them. They never expect the weeds to do it. They worry about insects, they worry about diseases, they don't have a plan in place for weeds. The availability of pesticides in New York State, uh, we are usually a couple of years behind some of our neighboring states in terms of the pesticides that are going to be available and labeled for the growers, the food safety issues we have, the changing climate. We're certainly seeing more extremes in the climate, and growers are aware of that. We're seeing longer seasons. That can be good, too. We're seeing crops that we couldn't grow here that you can grow here as well. We have the issue of the large farms versus the smaller farms. Yeah, a lot of the same problems, but how are they going to react to those problems, what are they going to do to try to solve those problems might be very different based on the scale. We have experienced farmers that have been in business with their families for generations, and we have farmers that are just getting started. And then finally, and I'm going to talk about this more at the end, the loss of faculty. And with the loss of faculty, the loss of the research that they were doing. Um, so again, this is my position, 10% teaching, 20% research, 70% extension. That was as of last Monday, that's going to change because apparently I will get some administration uh, in there as well. And if you look at this one picture, that is me pipetting um, something out of, a, out of a bottle. And I'd love to tell you that it's a nice, safe, uh, maybe a surfactant or something that I was using, but this is the 1980s and this was a time when, you know, things were done a little recklessly and that was probably a very bad insecticide for potatoes that I was uh, putting out at that time. Um, it's probably why my hair turned gray so prematurely <laughs> because of that. But again, I, I got a chance to work at the experiment station at Rutgers and, and really had a good time down there. In terms of teaching, I teach three different classes. I, I teach the, the Hort 3500, that's the vegetable production class that I teach with Robin Belinder. Came out of the old class that Roy Ellerbrock used to teach. Um, new class I just started this year, it's just a one credit, which was a lot of fun, which is organic vegetable gardening. And then, uh, since 2000, I've been teaching a three-week section of the, the Hort 14. That, that, that number's not right, is it? 40, it should be 45, four, well, whatever. It's the plant nutrition class. And I teach a three-week section in vegetables uh, in that as well. The uh, teaching is a lot of fun. Uh, the one thing I love about teaching is with the students, they ask you questions that always get you thinking and having to do a little bit more research because you have to answer the question the next time you see them. And in our vegetable production class, you know, I really have to thank the, uh, Steve McKay and his crew over at Freeville because they take a Saturday morning, we take the, the class out, they get to see everything from the t how, it, how a field is prepared all the way to putting down plastic and planting into that plastic mulch and how trickle irrigation works. And not only do they get to see that, but they get to do that. They're driving the tractors, they're, dr they're working the equipment, and um, so far, we haven't lost anybody and haven't had any major accidents, but it's just been a wonderful experience. We have field trips that we go on. Um, we go out and see some of the processing vegetables being harvested. We visit a processing plant. Uh, we go to some smaller fresh market operations and see what they've got. And if you look up here in the upper right-hand corner, that's actually a corn harvester, and about half the class is actually up on the corn harvester going through the field watching that um, harvest take place. In terms of advising, I don't have any undergraduates that I do advise. I never have had any. Um, 
I have been lucky enough to have three students that went through the summer internship program that Cornell Cooperative Extension offers, and that's a wonderful program. If you haven't been able to participate in it, it's really good. It, what it does is it matches an undergraduate student with either a county or regional-based person around the state, and you as a faculty, and you design a project that that person will work on and then report on. It's also a wonderful way to try to identify potential graduate students, because my first one was Sarah Ulick that I had back in 2008. And once I worked with Sarah for that summer, that was somebody I watched for the next few years so I could grab her as a graduate student, who, of course, we did have her, and she just finished up uh, just last year working on pumpkins. And we had Ed Miles um, here that I'm sure many of you remember that was doing a project in peppers and cover cropping. Um, looking at the research, I just sort of listed the crops that I work on and sort of the areas, soil fertility, stand establishment. I have ICM, or integrated crop management, because a lot of the work that I do is working in cooperatively with the entomologist and the plant pathologist or weed scientist to try to come up with sort of a horticultural um, aspect to the, the problem that we're looking at to see if there's a cultural method that you know, is, is going to be different than what they may have. And I think some of the best uh, and most enjoyable things I've done is the cooperative work that, I, that I've been participating in over the past 20 years. I like to, I'm going to point this one out as an example that I think is just a really good example of cooperation. You know, I think land-grant colleges, universities are often blamed as being very slow to react to things. And here was a problem that first came up. Growers came to us in the fall of 2001. They had a problem. There was a new um, aphid that was out there, the Asian soybean aphid, came in from probably Canada, uh, was first reported in New York in 2001, um, and since then we've, it's been with us every year. Well, one more aphid, you know, we're used to aphids. The problem with that was that it was carrying cucumber mosaic virus. And the cucumber mosaic virus was causing huge yield losses in snap beans, processing snap beans and fresh market snap beans. So what were we going to do to try to combat this? Well, this is where, again, being able to call on colleagues that have expertise in so many different areas can really be helpful. Um, again, Mark Fuchs, the virologist up in, in Geneva, who, you know, Whenever you bring him a sample of anything that looks like it potentially has virus, he gets excited about it. He always tells you it's not virus and blames Robin a herbicide or something, as we like to do. <laughs> but it's great to have him there and be able to, to take any samples that we've got. So we've got him there to, to really anchor everything. You know, the long-term solution, of course, is breeding. Phil Griffiths has a very active snap bean breeding program. Breeding takes time. But he's got some wonderful materials that are coming out into the pipeline now that are resulting in varieties that are truly resistant to cucumber mosaic virus as well as some other viruses. Brian Nault, the entomologist, he was looking at the soybean aphid. How is it spreading? Is there an insecticide that could be used? Are there seed treatments that could be used? What's happening? Where is it coming from? So working out all of those things. Question about, was the seed born? Well, we have Al Taylor in seed science, and he helped us with that in some of the early work on some of the variety establishment. Julie Kickert who's not on faculty, but is an extension educator working on the Cornell Vegetable Program, working with, uh, in Western New York with processors, who's that liaison between the faculty and the work that's going on here and with the industry, and actually helping to do some of the field trials as well. And then finally, in my program, what we did was we looked at all the existing varieties. It's going to take a while to breed new ones. What existing varieties that are out there that could actually make a difference in terms of the grower being able to plant this year and the year after and the year after and get by until we have truly resistant varieties. So you know, we, we worked together. We had funding from the Fi Farm Viability Institute, from Ag and Markets, um, you know, put these trials out. And at the, in the end, at least in my part of the program, we found about a half a dozen varieties that were actually quite tolerant to this virus, that they could plant. And even in a year where you had soybean aphids at very high levels and high virus levels, you were still able to get a pretty good yield from that. Okay, um, and again, and we're constantly checking for the new varieties. And some of this leads to other research because what we found was that the varieties that seem to be more tolerant to the disease, actually, we need to look at the fertility levels because they're responding to more nitrogen, more than what we traditionally have done with beans. And that's something we've got to look at for, for next year. But again, I just throw that out as a really good example of, you know, when we come together and we work together, we can really get some good solutions here. And the pumpkin work that we did, you know, traditionally, for many years, pumpkins were probably the last crop that a grower seeded, went back at the end of the year, harvested whatever he had, and that was it. Things start to change by the early 1990s. Americans are spending a lot of money on Halloween, buying a lot of pumpkins for jack-o'-lanterns. And yes, probably 99.5% of all the pumpkins that are grown in this, in this state, in this country, 
outside of Illinois where they're growing for processing aren't grown just for ornamental sales. Okay. So the typical thing they do, the grower goes out, plants a seed, overseeds it, may go back and thin or just leave it alone, and then he harvests. The question comes up, as the seed gets more expensive, the growers come to us and say, what about using transplants? Okay, are there are other methods that we could use so we don't have to, you know, the seed's expensive as we're getting new varieties that are coming out that are very resistant and to, you know, tolerant to diseases like powdery mildew. You know, what about using some other methods? Well, we fooled around with it. I did a lot of work in the 1990s where working with Dale Riggs, as some of you might remember, and we were looking at spacing of pumpkins, trying to get the ideal spacing for the yield that you want. If you're a grower that's selling pumpkins by number, so you want a lot of fruit, but they could be smaller, put the pumpkins more closely together, get more higher plant population. If you're growing by size, you want the pumpkins of a bigger size, space them out more. Fewer plants per acre would give you a larger size pumpkin. Okay. So again, you know, pumpkins are a great crop to work with. Not only they're, they're one that you don't need to be harvesting every couple of days like you do with tomatoes and peppers. Um, you go out there at the end of the year, you pick up everything that's there, you weigh it, you've got your, your yield data. And plus, when you have a field of two acres of pumpkins, you're very popular in the fall. A lot of people are always going to be happy that you've got some pumpkins and you can easily get rid of those. When we've been doing trials with beets, sometimes people are not that happy about getting all the extra beets that we have. <laughs> so what I've got here, what Sarah did in her work was she looked at the traditional planting, direct seeding into bare ground. And that's that red bar over there. And this is the, the yield per plot. So this isn't on a per acre or a hectare. This is kilograms per plot. And then the, the green, blue, and yellow, those are the different transplant sizes she was using. Okay? So the, the green was a smaller transplant. You could get more plants into the greenhouse with those, up to the yellow, which was a larger transplant. And again, so it's going to take up more room, be a more expensive transplant. Grow them for about three weeks. Doesn't have to be in the greenhouse very long. And she planted those right into the bare ground. And what we saw was 30, 40 percent, even in better increase in yield that we had out there with the pumpkins when we were doing that. So the growers are also asking, well, what about, you know, if you're, if you're doing transplants, what about putting the transplants right into plastic mulch instead of bare ground? So again, one of the trials that she did that same year was, again, using direct seeded into plastic mulch, just making a hole in the plastic mulch and planting along with the transplant size. And you can see that, again, the yields were increased with all of those compared to what was the traditional planting of direct seeding into bare soil. And what we you know, came away with here is that a grower has two options. A grower could, if they want to go with bare soil um, and not use plastic mulch, they could do that, but they're going to be a real advantage in terms of the yield if they use a transplant, three-week-old transplant. The other advantage, if they didn't want to go that way, they could use plastic mulch and they could direct seed it. What happens when you direct seed into plastic mulch? It's warm, the environment is perfect, you get germination very quickly. And by doing either going into plastic or using transplants, what can happen is that you can plant later. Instead of pumpkins that need to be probably planted around the 5th or 10th of June, you can plant probably almost as late as the 1st of July. So now you're talking about being able to get maybe two crops in that field in the same season. So again, that's a real advantage that we have. It does cost more, and Sarah ran the numbers with Brad Rickert, and you know, we found that with yield increase of probably 20, 25 percent, you easily would pay for the plastic mulch or the, uh, the transplant cost that you'd have. Okay. Now, I know probably many of us have bad things to say about entomologists, but <laughs> I do want to say that entomologists, um, when you find a good one, and, and, we, and we certainly have some good ones here at Cornell, and uh, Jess Peterson was a, a postdoc, and she was working with Brian Nault. And Brian's been doing a lot of work looking at pollination issues in pumpkins. And for, I'm sure most of you realize this, but pumpkins are monoecious. So they've got male and they've got female flowers. And of course, you need the bees to, to go in and move that pollen. Fascinating plants, because what you see is that there's usually you know, 20 to 30 male flowers for every female flower. You know, unlike the human population where every male is valued, in pumpkins, not so much. <laughs> and there's a lot of environmental effects that can have an impact on the number of female flowers versus male flowers. Um, and when you're doing this kind of work, you, know, you have to go out there early in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, when the flowers are just beginning to open and start to do this work. So, and there's a lot more to this, but I just wanted to boil this down because this is something that really changes the way people have traditionally been augmenting their fields with bees. Do you need to put hives out there? Certainly we're having a problem. We've seen colony collapse disorder. We're not seeing the bee populations that 
we normally have. If you can find somebody willing to bring hives in, they become very expensive. So this was just looking at the average fruit weight in three different uh, fields. And this was several, well, you can see there's you know, um, 12, 17, 14 different fields, the grower fields that we had, where they were supplemented with bumblebees, where they were supplemented with honeybees, and where they didn't put any bees out there. And you can see that there was no differences at all in terms of the average fruit weight per plant. Okay? It didn't matter whether you had bees out there or not. You were still getting that. If you look at this in terms of the bee visits per flower, so this is where you've got to be sitting outside and looking and counting the number of bees and the type of bees that are coming in. Again, thank God for entomologists here, and Jess Peterson in particular. But if you look at the first graph uh, on, the, on the left side, you know that this is where the yellow is where we supplemented with bumblebees, and the gray is where it was non-supplemented. And this is the number of bee visits. Didn't matter, okay? Whether we put bees out there or not, there were enough native bees they were visiting anyway where we supplemented, didn't increase the number. Honeybees, more visits, but again, not any different between whether it was with supplements or not. So where are the, what are these bees doing out there um, when, you, when you go through the expense and the time to put those out there? Well, again, looking at bees and typing the pollen that's coming off all of them, you know, what she found was that pumpkins, curbit pollen, was one of the last places they want to go. Uh, bumblebees and especially honeybees would much prefer other crops. You can see you know, corn. Uh, the Solanaceae, the uh, Fabiaceae, Asterae, all of these others, when you, when you actually looked at the pollen that was on these, this was much more preferred to, to cucurbits. So cucurbits is kind of that last resort. They'll go to it, but they much prefer some of these other things. So this changes what we recommend. And the grower asks, do I need to put bees in my pumpkin fields anymore? Do I need to go through that expense? Well, based on the work that Jess Peterson and, and Brian Alt have been doing, the answer would seem to be no. Worked some with Dick Robinson uh, back in the 90s where we were looking at the production of summer squash without pollination. Okay, so essential, and so again, I talked about the problem with bees, but a lot of organic growers will cover their plants with row covers because they can't keep out the uh, cucumber beetles any other way. Of course, if you're covering a plant with row covers that needs pollination and, and bees, you're gonna have to take that cover off. Okay, so there's a lot of work that goes into that. Are there plants, are there squash out there that could actually produce fruit without pollination. We found some work, again, working with Dick Robinson in the 90s, it seems like there was, you know, we, we published a paper on that that showed that especially the green, the zucchini type seemed to be that, um, more likely to do that. And we did some work this past year where we were going out and we were bagging up all the flowers, going back out. And again, the, the trend is that the green, the zucchini type, are gonna be ones that are able to pr produce without the pollination occurring. But the one that produced 100%, every single bag flower produced a marketable fruit, was this one Golden Glory, which is a yellow one. So again, this could be very valuable for folks that either have a bee problem or are covering the plants up. In soil fertility, when I came here in uh, 1994, I'd been working on the, the pre-cydrus nitrate test. It's this wonderful test that allows the grower to know the level of nitrate in that top foot of soil. And if they know that level of nitrate at the time when the crop would typically be side dressed with additional nitrogen. If it's above 25 to 30 parts per million, they didn't need any additional nitrogen. And, you know, we, and we were looking at it throughout all the different crops, and it seemed like that, you know, be conservative, 30 parts per million. If you had a level of right before the time you'd side dress of 30 parts per million, you really didn't need any additional nitrogen. Um, growers were kind of excited about it, but not too excited. Um, it required a, a separate soil test at a very busy time of the year, and the results had to come back very quickly. If I went to a grower and said, oh, remember that field we tested three weeks ago? Guess what? You should have put nitrogen on two weeks ago. They never were really too happy about that. <laughs> and the big difference between vegetables and field crops, where this has been worked out very well for uh, field corn, is the prices. You know, if I tell a field corn grower that they might be able to save 40, 50 bucks on nitrogen, they listen. If I tell a sweet corn grower or a tomato grower or a pepper grower that they could save that, when it might take $2,000, $3,000, $5,000 to establish the crop, they're not gonna take that chance. Even if I tell them there's a 95% chance they won't have a problem, they're gonna put on that insurance application. So, how do we get around that? Well, I've worked with Corinne Kettering. She's got very interesting work that she's done using the Illinois so soil nitrogen test. And if you do that with the looking at the loss on ignition organic matter, 
you develop this curve, and if anything, if your numbers come in with the ISNT level and the loss on ignition come in above that, you're probably not needing any additional nitrogen out there. If it comes in below, you're going to have to put that on. And then working with Jeff Milconian on the ADAPT N, which is really fascinating, you don't even need to take a soil test for this. Now, this is just based on computer simulations that look at the soil, that look at the environment, the past history that you've got out there. But again, it comes back to, for growers, insurance applications, I don't want to take that chance on a high value crop. And I think what we're trying to do now is figure out how do we talk about this in terms of quality of the crop? Is it having an impact on the quality of the crop? And that's where I think we can get growers to buy into it on the very high value crops. Um, working with uh, Chris Smart, uh, back in 2008, we established a Phytophthora farm. Phytophthora blight is a tremendous problem in vegetable crops. It affects more than half of the vegetables that grow and it, in a very wet areas. Again, it just will cause complete collapse of the plant. So we have a nine acre site up in Geneva where we, we've introduced this. And again, you know, one of the tough lessons when you work with a plant pathologist is you've got to be ready for losses. And if you look at this beautiful pumpkin field that's down here on the right hand corner, this was one of the best pumpkin fields I've ever seen. Unfortunately, it was being grown at the Phytophthora farm, and Chris Smart and her graduate student Amara went out and treated it with Phytophthora, made sure they added it, and it quickly melted down. Uh, they get good results, but it still is a horticulturalist. Um, sometimes bothers me <laughs> when I see that sort of thing happen. Um, but again, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity because we can really study this disease on a farm. Um, we have it fenced off, we have equipment just for that farm, so we're not gonna be bringing that to other areas. Michael Mazurik, is, we, he's got a wonderful breeding program for peppers, uh, where we're looking at resistant uh, varieties, and we can put those up there under some really harsh conditions. We can test some seed company material as well under harsh conditions. And you know, Ed Miles was doing some work looking at the possibility of using some cover cropping between rows of plastic to stop the splashing that would come from the between row area onto the plants, where again, even with some of the resistant varieties, they still might succumb to the splashing in the foliar phase of the disease. In processing vegetables, there's two major processors that we have in New York today. Seneca Foods, who has been in this state for many, many, many years, and Bondwell, who, you know, we could go back to Bird's Eye, and we can go back to AgriLink, and there's sort of a long history. But those are the ones that are the, one, the major producers of those uh, crops here in New York. And again, what we do, um, and Jim really leads this program is the variety trial program that we do, and this is really expanded. We do sweet corn, uh, peas, and beans every year, and I think what sets our program apart from a lot of others is that, yes, we do the growing in the field, we look at the horticultural characteristics in the field, but then we can bring the product back into the food science building, into the pilot plant, we can freeze it, we can can it, and then what we do in the fall, we bring the processors, we bring the seed company folks back where they actually will look at the canned peas, the canned corn, the, the frozen product, and see what does it look like when it's processed. Maybe something looked really good in the field, but if it processes kind of gray, it's not something they're going to want to be able to use, and they can pick that up in those trials that way. And again, um, I really have Jim to, to thank for, for leading the effort on that. Getting into extension, um, 70% you know, or it had been 70% that's probably going to go down. There's a lot of sort of traditional things I've been doing and probably some non-traditional things as well. Um, you know, down here at the, uh, there's no reason why you can't have some fun with things. Um, back here, if you look at the lower corner there, it says Corn Cornell versus Rutgers. And that was when I challenged my Cornell uh, peers about who had the better tasting tomato, the, New the Jersey tomato or New York. So we grew the same variety two different locations. And uh, we took this down to New Jersey where they have this 2,000 people come in for this huge tomato fest. And um, I am proud to say that we killed New Jersey in terms of the taste. <laughs> uh, probably more to do with the, uh, the stage of ripeness of our tomatoes compared to anything else. But I'll still say that we, we, that we beat them. And they don't like that to be uh, publicized too much either. Um, Certainly, I work a lot. This is something that I took over was the, the Cordell guidelines, used to be called the recommendations. When I arrived, we had two separate books. We had a book on culture. We had a book on essentially pesticides, pest control. And uh, we got a grant, Kurt Petzold, Mike Hoffman and I, back before Mike Hoffman was an administrator when he was still useful. And uh, <laughs> Mike's not here, hopefully. And um, 
we were able to get a grant and reformat to put everything back into one book. And the idea was we wanted to have all the cultural information there too because so much of that, you know, the, the pesticides are important but they should be the last resort. We wanted to give them sort of equal footing with some of the cultural things that a grower can do before they need to reach for the pesticide. And we also had, we were the first guidelines, I think, to be up on the web. And it's not, it's more than just a PDF version that we have because thanks again to Kirk Petzold and now with Abby Seaman, you know, we have this um, available where there's links to everything. So if you go in and you go into a chapter on, on pumpkins, you can click on something and go to variety trials on pumpkins. You can go see what's been done in terms of disease control trials that they have just with a, a click. So again, you know, the big question is how long are we going to be able to continue that? The other guidelines that are working through PMEP are not going to be available this year online. We still have ours because we've been, really thanks to Kurt and, and Abby, we've been doing it in a different way. But uh, we're, we're surveying the growers now to see just how important they feel this is. Well, the Empire Expo, I know many of you have been speakers up there. Um, and again, this is Currently, it's a four-day meeting where we include the Becker Forum. The Becker Forum, named after Bob Becker, is focusing on you know, some major issue that's facing the fruit, the vegetable industry at this time. It tends to be on labor because that is, seems to be the number one issue. We have three days of sessions focused on educational meetings. There's 40 different sessions that we have, lots of exhibitors, lots of at attendees. And again, we've seen this, this grow from the old vegetable conference and some of you remember and then it, we had the berry growers join us, we had the Hort Society join us, we've had direct marketers join us, the New York Farm Federation, the Farm Market Federation join us, the flower growers join us. So it's getting bigger all the time. And that, you know, it's really what we love to see is that, again, you know, instead of trying to separate things out, let's get together and focus on the big picture. And that's been working really well. And then I want to take some time and just talk about the Cornell Regional Teams because this has a big impact, I think, on us here at the university. It has an impact in a good way and has an impact in a bad way. And this is what I covered. If any of you remember that seminar I gave where I had 20 seconds to talk about um, every different, each slide that I had, I didn't have much time. So the, the Cornell Regional Teams versus you know, the traditional extension and what's the difference. And if you look at the, the, the traditional, you know, it was county, county focus. There was a single county, they were employed by the county, they were for the most part a generalist, there wasn't too much research, uh, the salary was lower, bachelor's degree, uh, they were up for county review, and they did work with the faculty, but again we didn't have the really the, the strong relationship I think that we're getting from the, the regional um, folks, which again are going across many counties. They are considered Cornell employees, although a good chunk of the money that supports them does come from the counties, they're specialists. They have a research component, and they're expected to be a leader in that area of research. A higher salary, and with that, a master's degree is required. And again, the review that we do uh, on an annual basis, and then for a three-year or five-year uh, reappointment, you know, is, is done here at the college, working with input from growers, working from input from the county people as well, and from um, input from faculty. So again, it's very different. The research component's expected, reputation, lots of grant writing, and the expectation to publish as well. And you know, we have some really successful programs out there. And we could talk about, if, if I was more familiar with some of the fruit programs, I could go on and on about them. And the ornamentals, which again, we don't have as regional programs, we have some wonderful people. But you know, Judd Reed has really taken the state lead in terms of high tunnels. And here's Chuck Bourne, who's wonderful with equipment. And Christy Hopton, who's become a, really an international leader in, in onions, and Crystal Stewart who's doing incredible work with garlic. Again, these are all specialists and has really done a, a good job in doing that. Um, you know, having them out there, they're gonna be the first ones that see things like Swede minge and cabbage and Drosophila and stink bug and leek moth and working with the entomologists or the pathologists and some of these new and emerging pests. You know, the perfect combination that we have. We've got, this is probably outdated. Uh, I think we may have more than 10 teams now, at least 34 specialists with retirement, some new people hired, it's probably about there. Um, and what's missing? We don't have the ornamental horticulture people involved, and that's something that I think we've really got to make a change in over the next few years. Uh, there's wonderful educators out there that are, are more county-based or an unofficial multi-county um, programs that they do have. The funding, where does the funding come from for this? 72% Theoretically, it's supposed to come from the counties, 20% from Cornell, and then 8% was expected to be generated by 
the program itself. And that could be through grants, that could be from meeting fees and things like that. In reality, if you just look at, uh, this is just a, from 2011, you know, the county funds have been actually going down. As costs have gone up, they haven't increased the money that they're putting into these programs. So now we're seeing in the Cornell Vegetable Program, you know, down to about 53% county funding. Cornell has stayed the same. And then the money, where it's coming from, is the incredible amount of, of money that the teams are bringing in, uh, mostly through grant writing. Uh, and that's just sort of the, the, how the, the team operates and you know, the connection to, to campus, the connection to the county, and the connection to the stakeholders. Um, and you know, I think there's, there's real advantages to that. Uh, to that system. Uh, we, we have good educators, they're wonderful people to work with. They're cooperators on grants. Sometimes they're writing the grants. Um, higher salary, it's great. We're getting better people to come in here. And, you know, if you, when you were offering $22,000 for a county extension position, um, people were finding other jobs. Sometimes they'd come for just a couple of years of experience and then leave. So again, we can get these folks uh, to stay and really develop expertise in areas. Why did it happen now? I think a couple of things that really pushed it. You know, this has been talked about for years. When, when I came on, Bob Becker had a file about this thick that talked about all of the attempts that had been made in his entire time here to regionalize programs. Um, so it's been, it's been talked about for years. You know, the recession, I think, got a lot of counties thinking beyond their borders. Because, well, if we're sharing a specialist, you know, maybe we could share the HR person. Maybe we could share the finance people. And so they're starting to break out of some of their thinking in terms of, you know, the, the ends of the county border. Um, we've had such wonderful success with the existing teams and with the educators that we have. You know, the stakeholders are really buying into this. They like working with that. They like having the applied research being done on their farms. And, you know, another issue we've got is people like me are not being replaced. And maybe some people would say, thank God for that. But, <laughs> When you, when you look at that, and just doing some numbers, I'm just looking at the faculty that are working in vegetable crops, that were working in vegetable crops when I was hired in 1994 in Geneva and Ithaca. And I'm sure we can make the same li list for ornamentals. We could do the same thing for, for fruit as well. I've got 10 people. I've got a little asterisk by Chris Ween, since he's still technically here, but he's on phase. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he is on phase retirement, but, we, but I, just asked, I just used him last week for a question we had on onions, and, and certainly, but you know, we won't have Chris around too much longer here at the, at the college. And how many people were hired that are working strictly on vegetables that were hired in either Geneva or Ithaca since 1994? How many do you think? In, again, just horticulture, not talking entomology, plant pathology. Give me a number. I've, I count two. I got Anu, came in 96. Phil Griffiths, Griff came in, in 99. We could potentially put Laurie Drinkwater in here, but I, I think of Laurie as more of a systems person. You know, it's looking at sort of the big picture. I mean, these are the, the folks that have been hired for vegetables. We've lost 10, we've got two. If I do the same math for the extension educators, you know, these are the people we lost since 94, retirement, moving on to other jobs, and on the right-hand side, these are the people that were hired. Okay. Our numbers are up on the extension side. We're, we're, we're going to this regional base whether we want to or not. It's happening. And I think some of us may not even be aware until you really sit down and, and think about it that way. I've got Carol McNeil in the middle. She was there when I started. She's still here, and I should, I should have put Abby Seaman in there as well because it's also somebody there. But again, that's really happening here. It's something that that, that has an impact, I think, on, on you know, where we're going to be and what we're going to be doing in the future. Um, talked about some of the challenges, you know, county always looking out for themselves, you know, what's in it for me, and I think they've gotten much better at that. Uh, will the outside funding, will it be enough? Hasn't been a problem. Will it compete? Will, the, will a Judd Reed working in high tunnels and getting grants in high tunnels, is that going to compete for me for the same amount of money? You know, there's, there's more than enough research to go around. And the other complaint or concern we had at the time was the extension educators are just gonna go where the money is, and they're not going to be focused on the stakeholder uh, questions. But you know what? Between the SARE program, the Farm Viability Institute, and others, there's good money available for grant funding for some of these applied projects. So again, some of those concerns haven't really come up. Um, 
what we do need to think about, you know, these people have very good expertise, um, but will they have enough of the expertise to go beyond, you know, some of the, the field work that they're doing, very good applied field work they're doing? Will they have access to greenhouse facilities or labs? Probably not. Um, you know, are they going to be able to keep up with and lead uh, technological innovations? Um, they're doing jobs that, you know, 20 years ago was being done by faculty um, at somewhat reduced fac uh, salaries compared to what the faculty were getting. The absence of ornamental horticulture, we've got to do something about getting those folks represented. And then for those of you that are, are just starting out, your graduate students here or an undergraduate here, one of the biggest problems we have is finding qualified master students for these positions. Okay? It took us three searches to add a new uh, faculty or a new extension educator that will be starting May 1st in Western New York. Three searches, we made two offers. They had other positions, other jobs were, were uh, offers were made and we lost them. We finally did get, I think, a very good person, a PhD in plant pathology. But uh, certainly in New York, and from what I'm seeing in other places, you know, this type of job and this reinvention of extension, where people have written off for so many years, you know, there's jobs out there for somebody that you know, is comfortable in the field and working with growers. Okay. And then finally, I just wanted to, to finish up talking about some of the work I do with, in, in gardening. And you think, well, gardening, you, know, you talked all about the research and you talked about working with growers and processing growers and 3,000 acre growers. What are you doing working in gardening? It's a small part of my job, but it's one I really like because when you work with gardeners, they are there because they want to hear what you have to say. They're not there for the pesticide credits. I realize that's why many growers are there. Um, so there's a lot of enthusiasm. It's the same as working with, with you know, teaching uh, students that are in classes that really want to be there. And so I, and it's, I think it's a great bridge for the public that doesn't understand agriculture. If you can use gardening as a way to get them to understand not only agriculture, but science, okay? I think that's really important as we try to move the public in New York. We've got so a uh, huge percentage of people that are totally clueless about agriculture. We want them on our side. So you can use gardening, I think, as a way to, to talk about agriculture and talk about science. But working with Chris Smart, we've been doing a program with the Geneva Elementary Schools where we've, uh, and I have K through 12, but really it's more K through uh, third grade, fourth grade. And what we do is every year we go over, we meet with the third grades. Uh, this year I think there's eight classes and 160 kids. We talk to them about seeds, we talk to them about plants, they plant, they, they start the seeds and things that we bring, the, the, we give them the potting mix, the, the, the trays. Chris brings it back, we put it in the greenhouse, we grow it there, the kids walk up from their school, they visit the experiment station, they go through her lab, they see microscopes, they see young people, graduate students that are working in science and hearing about potential jobs that could be available for them. These are kids, you know, Geneva, we've got everything up there from, from very, very low income to kids that are coming out of very successful and rich families. And for some, they never get exposed to this sort of thing. We take them through the greenhouse. We show them what's growing on out there. And yes, many times they're more interested in the fan that's blowing cool air in on them because they're complaining because it's so hot. But I think still you're making some impact. And then we take everything back and we plant everything out at this huge garden that we have. And every class gets to do that. And that's followed by a summer science camp that Chris has put together. We're in our 10th year of doing that where we bring in scientists from Hobart and William Smith. We bring in scientists from the experiment station. And they talk about their areas that they're working in and they give the kids projects that they can work on as third graders going into fourth grade. You know, and if you can get kids interested in gardening, I mean, all the studies will show that they're going to be more active, they're going to think about and eat healthier, and that is so important today. So I like to think that you know, we are having some impact, but it is a lot of fun as well to be working with this group of kids. And again, we do some weird things here. We're planting into straw bales. Um, and we did a little experiment where you put nitrogen on it and you create this little mini compost pile and it gets really hot and we put thermometers in and the kids were going out and registering the temperature of the, the bales where we put ammonium nitrate in versus blood meal where it was just water. So you know, little experiments that they can do, weird planters that we have. And, you know, and finally I just want to say that you know, I've been very, very fortunate in my life to, you know, working first at, at Rutgers, PhD from the Ohio State University, um, and then going back to Rutgers and working there and, and still having some, some good connections with the folks there. 
and then coming here to Cornell. And I know sometimes it's easy to get frustrated with you know, demands that the administration is doing or going, you know, putting in things into your activity insight reports, but you know, you gotta take a step back sometimes and just think, well, I'm gonna speak for myself, I'm very lucky. I can work with somebody that's thinking about creating an Eastern broccoli market or creating heart-shaped tomatoes or somebody that's willing to get up at five o'clock in the morning to count the number of bees visiting a flower and what type of pollen they have. And I've got a, I work with a technician who not only will come in on the 4th of July to help harvest peas, but motivates the summer kids we have to do the same thing. And Chris Smart, who's just this wonderful person to work with in terms of the, uh, the phytophthora work in the schools. And you know, I think a lot of people don't get up and look forward to coming to work. And yeah, if you can think, just don't dwell on some of the negative things that we all have to face, but we're, I think, pretty lucky. And with that, I'm going to stop and happy to try to answer some questions with two minutes left. So the question was, how do we get the new extension director? Uh, we give him a roadmap to get the ornamental people uh, there. You know, I think, uh, I think the, the template is there. We, we know how to do it. Um, We've got this now Eastern New York horticulture team. So now we've got fruit and vegetables there. We can add those others uh, to it. Uh, Chris is on board. One of the things I didn't mention, one of the reasons why this has been happening with the regional teams is because we've had Helene Dillard, Chris Watkins, and especially Mark Giles that really helped push this forward. So I think it's there. I think we've got the people in place. Um, I think it's just a matter of taking the next step. Right, so the, the question was about the, the PSNT, the pre dress nitrate test. And what that does is it, it, it takes a snapshot of the available nitrate that's in that top foot of soil. And what goes into that nitrate level is, of course, the, uh, the organic matter that's being broken down and, and freeing up some of that available nitrogen. So all uh, the additional nitrogen fertilizer that might have been put in there in the spring or the year before that might still be in the soil. So all of that goes into that PSNT value. And then from that value, we could tell a grower, you don't need to add any additional nitrogen, or yes, you do need to add additional nitrogen. Yeah, so the question is, you know, what could be available in the soil, nitrogen that could be available? And, you know, the general rule of thumb that we have is based on a soil test, if you've got, for every 1% organic matter that you've got in your soil, you can assume you probably have 15 to 20 pounds of available nitrogen. So a 3% organic matter level in the soil is going to give you potentially 45 to uh, 60 pounds of available nitrogen that they don't need to add to that, that would be available. And that gets into a problem and, and uh, that I, I want to get into um, in a couple of years, hopefully with Brian Nolf, we've been talking about that and I know Chris Ween has looked into this. Too much nitrogen in pumpkins, for example, has really uh, very bad effects in terms of the yield. It has an effect on the female flowers. Uh, either directly or through pollination or through too much shading. So you can have this beautiful field of pumpkins that look great, and then when the foliage dies back at the end of the year, there's no pumpkins out there. Um, and that nitrogen is playing a role in that somehow too. Yeah, and I'm just repeating the question for the folks in Geneva, it's about urban horticulture, and that you know, it's, it's not an area that we, we've really got people working too much in here in this department or even so much in extension, but um, Marvin and I just had a chance to sit down with, with uh, Griff last week, and he's really, you know, if you want to talk to somebody that's got an idea of where we're going in urban horticulture in terms of, you know, growing food in warehouses and lighting and stuff, and there's a whole area that maybe for some people when they think of urban horticulture, they're thinking of gardening um, and large gardens and rooftop gardens, and that's part of the mix, but there's a whole different thing that we can add to it as well. And I know as a department, we've been talking about, you know, a position in that, and I think, um, there's a lot of different ways we could go with that, but there certainly could be some, uh, a, a real growth area in that. And the food deserts that are in cities, you know, can we provide that? Grow the food ourselves? I don't know. Well, what should happen is they have to pay more. They have to pay lots more. Uh, I showed you that, that picture of the industry. The fresh market side is worth 450 million. And if I go very broadly in terms of what they're raising between onions, Potatoes, cabbage, uh, you know, they're probably not over even $100,000. Processing, which is worth one-tenth of that, is raising $150,000.
it, we have just, it's a drop in the bucket in terms of the support we're currently getting. We really need to, to increase that, you know, five to tenfold at least. And that's got to happen. Or there aren't going to be the people, there's not going to be the faculty, and there's not going to be the research that does it. The industry has to step up. And I think they're getting there. Um, but it's, it's where we have to go. So the question was about, you know, are there things you could plant to, to help bring in the pollinators? Uh, the problem is if it's very attractive to the pollinators and the mason bees, that's where they're going to go and we'll see the same thing. They'll just be covered in that pollen. Um, it seems like there, there's no, probably the best thing you can do is create a habitat, um, sort of a wild area close to the field that isn't plowed where a lot of the native bees will make their nest. Okay, and that really helps quite a bit. But yeah, it's, it's a big change. So, the, the, well, you all heard the question was, um, is there an optimum ratio of male to female flowers for, for pumpkin production? Um, it changes so much through the season, Tinong, that, you know, depending on whether it's very hot and the stress or if it's very cold and it's very rainy. And I've seen very produ good production out of all those systems. The key is, as long as there's that, uh, a female flower that a bee can find, and the male flower as well, usually not a problem with the male flowers, um, so as long as you've got some, some female flowers there, uh, you should be okay. Is there an ideal ratio? I don't know, is Michael here? Mazurk? Or, okay, because he, he does some work in curvets and, and, but there probably is. It's just something I'm, I wouldn't be aware of. Yeah, so the question was about using Ethophon for sex expression and no, it's, it's not a labeled material. I, I played around with it a bit and it, it does work, but it seems like you get enough female flowers that you'll be okay. Okay, well, anything else from Geneva? All right, well good, thank you very much. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.